In this presentation, we're going to talk about the cold storage aspects of storage facility design. We'll be covering temperature controlled storage areas, order assembly areas, and also aspects of material handling, material handling equipment relevant to the use in cold storage areas. There are three commonly used storage temperature ranges for cold chain products. For products that need to be kept frozen, the typical range is minus 15 to minus 25 degrees centigrade. The vast majority of cold chain products should be stored at plus 2 to plus 8 degrees centigrade. There are some products which inherently thermostable but which are damaged by high temperature which can be kept at controlled ambient temperatures of say around plus 25 degrees centigrade. In addition, there are some specialist products such as blood plasma which need to be stored at other temperature ranges, but we will be concentrating in this presentation on the three temperature ranges I've spoken about. So let's start with products that are labelled for controlled storage at above plus 8 degrees centigrade. These products require a temperature controlled room that operates within the labelled temperature range. Uh, Often this will be an air-conditioned room. But wherever possible, because the cooling demands are relatively light, make maximum use of passive energy conservation techniques. For example, the use of ground source heat pumps, earth air heat exchangers, or nighttime cooling, which is uh, a traditional technique which is used in desert areas and can be very effective for this purpose. Let's look now at the storage options for cold rooms and freezer rooms. We have three alternative approaches. We can either have goods stored on pallet racking where they are accessed by forklift trucks of one kind or another, or we can store the goods directly on the floor on pallets. This technique is called pallet standing. Again, you need mechanical handling equipment to move the goods around the store. Finally, we can use shelving, which is commonly found in small cold rooms and is widely used, particularly in vaccine stores. Cold rooms and freezer rooms come in a variety of sizes. So there are a number of construction options that can be, can be considered. Um, the most common for cold rooms up to 100 or so, so cubic metres is panel construction. Stores of this type can be built with spans up to 6 metres, heights up to 6 metres, but they have to be assembled within an existing building. They're not weatherproof on their own, so it's essential to find a space in which to install them. Alternatively, if there's nowhere to build such an enclosure, it's possible to get container-based units which can be moved around from site to site. These are inherently weatherproof and uh, they follow the format of a standard international shipping container. When we move on to large cold store buildings, there are four different options. The first is to create an internally insulated store. Here we take an existing building and we line it with insulated panels. The second option is to have an externally insulated store. Here you build your building and you insulate the outside of the structure with insulation panels. The third option is to have a panel-based store. Here you buy prefabricated panels and assemble them on a framework so that the store is able to stand on its own and is internally supported. And the final option is what we call a high-rise store, which again is panel-based, but relies on the pallet racking structure to hold up the panels. Let's talk a little bit about how we deal with controlled and hazardous cold chain products, because these have to be dealt with specially and kept secure. So it's essential to have dedicated, securely locked facilities which are compliant with local legislation and regulations. For example, you might have in a small store a um, locked cupboard that is specially designed and approved for use with controlled substances. In a larger store, you're likely to have a locked room, which is security protected and <coughs> connected to alarm systems. You also have to consider 
the type of product you're storing in your hazardous and controlled store because some of these products are corrosive and some of them are explosive and you have to make sure that the location is designed in such a way that it can cope with accidents occurring when these products leak or explode. So let's talk a little bit about materials handling in larger stores. It's very important that shelving stores in particular are designed and managed so that workers are not exposed to lifting injuries. The diagram we show here illustrates the weights that people can carry when they're taking items off the shelves at particular heights. So if you're reaching for products at that sort of height, you shouldn't be carrying much more than five kilograms. If you're reaching for products at waist height, you can carry up to 20 kilograms. If you're dealing with pallets, then you have to have suitable mechanical handling equipment. And if the pallet handling equipment is mechanical, then you have to have charging points to charge the batteries in the forklift trucks and pallet trucks. In very large stores where there's a high throughput of product, you may want to consider systems like flow racking and other automation systems which allow products to be handled with high efficiency and minimum labor input. Let's move now on to the smaller facilities where we rely largely on refrigerators and freezers to store our products. There are a number of different types of refrigerator and freezer which are suitable for particular types of a store or particular restrictions on a power supply. For example, you might use standard pharma vaccine refrigerators in facilities which have good reliable electricity, but where you have as little as eight hours electricity a day, you're going to have to consider using Iceland refrigerators because these have a long hold over time which allow the product to be maintained at the required temperature for many hours when the electricity fails. There's another type of ref refrigerator which is related to the Iceland refrigerator called a waterline refrigerator, which can have extremely long holdover times and may be able to operate on electricity supplies with as little as four hours of electricity per day. Where you have no electricity at all, the options are to go for gas or kerosene absorption refrigerators, which are inherently not inefficient and where whose um, temperature control is less than ideal. Alternatively, we can talk about the possibility of using solar refrigerators, and there are two types of solar refrigerator. Those which rely on a battery bank to keep them running in periods of low sun, which are solar battery drive refrigerators, and here we have an example. And the other more recently introduced type is solar direct drive refrigerator, which requires no battery bank whatsoever, but stores cool in an ice bank within the refrigerator, like an ice-lined refrigerator. So let's now talk a bit about order assembly areas for cold chain products, because it's important that these areas are temperature controlled as well. They don't necessarily have to be at the same temperature as the storage areas, but they certainly shouldn't be more than 25 degrees centigrade. And in some cases, it may be necessary to have the order assembly areas actually within the cold room itself or in an antechamber to the cold room. It's essential to have clean working surfaces, adequate size for assembling the orders, and access to packaging materials and coolant packs where these are needed for packing the products for onward shipment in the supply chain under temperature controlled conditions. At service delivery points, um, of course, uh, products are not being transported large, large distances. They may be simply going from the pharmacy to a hospital ward or to um, in a clinic to the immunization room. But again, you need clean working surfaces to pack the products and the appropriate containers to put the product in so that they're maintained under temperature control conditions up to the point of use. Finally, let's say a little bit about power supply because especially in larger stores where there's a huge value of product potentially at risk, it's absolutely essential to have an uninterrupted power supply. This is particularly true where there are cold rooms or freezer rooms because these don't have a very long holdover period in the event of a power failure. 
Typically, facilities will rely on a standby generator. They may also need to have voltage regulators where the local electricity supply is unreliable and fluctuates a great deal. An alternative approach is to provide power from two separate substations on the mains because if one substation fails you have another substation to provide the power but this is only really an option in situations where the mains electricity supply, power supply is generally pretty reliable. It's better in most settings to have a standby generator. In the case of facilities that operate refrigerators and freezers only, if there's a large quantity of product being stored, you may still require a standby generator, but at a minimum, you need to have voltage regulators for each of the refrigerators to ensure that voltage spikes don't damage the cold chain equipment. In pharmacies and service delivery points, you need to be sure that you select your refrigeration equipment to suit the available fuel and power situation. We've seen in this presentation that there's a wide range of equipment available for storing cold chain products and we've covered the types of facility where each of these are applicable. We've also talked about the importance of appropriate materials handling equipment and methods, the importance of maintaining the cold chain during the order assembly process and the need to ensure that there is an uninterrupted power supply in larger facilities where cold chain products are kept.